All right. So again, welcome with um, Sheila Divitt. She is uh, going to lead us through the history of herbal medicine in the US and she is a practicing herbalist with more than two decades of experience. So go ahead and take it away and welcome Sheila. All right, thank you. Um, hi everybody, my name is Sheila Devitt and I uh, am a practicing herbalist. I am also a student at City College of San Francisco and I am uh, enrolled in the Cannabis Studies program and I'm also pursuing uh, biological sciences uh, as it relates to my herbal medicine practice. Um, I would like to start by thanking the professors, uh, Natalie Cox, Blake Barker, and Professor Doggart Carlin for um, this opportunity to speak with all of you today about herbal medicine in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, if you would like to type into the chat uh, where you are zooming in from um, and um, if you would also like to take an opportunity to um, share a favorite plant that is native to your region, you can do so in the chat, and that's optional. Um, I am adopting a practice that I saw modeled where uh, um, Speaking respectfully means not talking about someone when they are not present. So when we speak of the land, it is respectful to have a representative. So I have with me today uh, a piece of Pacific Rim Jade to represent the land that we are acknowledging today. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, an illustration of plants and uh, where they are native to around the world. Next slide. Uh, so this is a little introduction to me and my uh, work history. These are some of the businesses that I have worked for over the last 20 or so years. Um, that includes um, Manufacturing, Vitality Works is a manufacturing company in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, that includes a few different retail stores, uh, a couple of different clinics. And I am currently on faculty at the East West School of Planetary Herbology. And that school uh, focuses on uh, that concept of planetary herbology that encompasses Western European and North American traditions as well as Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine. Next slide. These are some professional memberships and affiliations. I am currently a member of the American Herbalist Guild, the American Botanical Council, the American Herbal Pharmacopoeia, and the United Plant Savers. And this is a representation of some of the professional organizations for herbalists in the United States. Next slide. All right. What is herbal medicine? Uh, definitions do vary by nationality because it is based on different legal and regulatory frameworks. So today we are going to do a quick historical overview of herbal medicine in the United States and touch on some of the regulatory framework for herbal medicine in the United States. Um, I've included here uh, a few definitions. Medical herbalism relies on an empirical appreciation of medicinal herbs, and which is often linked to traditional knowledge. That's Encyclopedia Britannica for us. They also give us the um, definition of phytotherapy, using plants to maintain and improve health. Um, Herbal medicine draws from both traditional systems of healing and contemporary evidence-based medicine to support and restore optimal health. That definition comes from the Maryland University of Integrative Health. Phytotherapy, we're talking about a couple of different Latin words put together there. Pharmacognosy is a word that isn't used as much in contemporary language, although there is still a, uh, there are still pharmacognosy professional organizations. Um, 
this was more popular up until about the 1950s and 1960s when uh, um, chemistry uh, started to take precedence in um, pharmacist training. But pharmacognosy is the branch of pharmacology that deals with drugs in their crude or natural state and with med medicinal herbs or other plants. Those four definitions relate directly to the practice of herbal medicine. Um, ethnobotany is a little more observational, a little less hands-on. So for those of you who uh, are taking or have taken anthropology classes, you may have come across um, ethnobotany in that context. Um, it is the system, systematic study of the botanical knowledge of a social group and its use of locally available plants in foods, medicines, clothing, or religious rituals. Next slide. Medical Herbalism. This is a textbook by David Hoffman. Um, David Hoffman is a British herbalist who actually lives here in Northern California. Uh, this textbook very broadly uh, describes the study and exploration of the interaction between humanity and the plant kingdom. So that covers a lot. Next slide. Our topic today is looking at the history of herbal medicine in the United States. And uh, so we're gonna cover some 1700s, 1800s, 1900s real briefly. Um, and I brought up this uh, map website. Uh, it's an interactive map that plays through changing boundaries of the United States and territories over time. So if that interests you, you can check it out and see how the United States uh, has expanded over the last two centuries or so. Uh, next slide. So we're gonna start our overview with Samuel Thompson um, and what is now often referred to as Thompsonian medicine. Um, Samuel Thompson, uh, 1769 to 1843, um, borrowed heavily from Native American herbal medicine and sweat baths. Um, he uh, has a reputation for being an obstinate individualist and anti-intellectual, and he developed his own system of herbal medicine um, sort of in um, objection to contemporary medicine practices of the time. Um, and his primary theory was that heat equals life and cold equals death, and he wanted to develop practice of herbal medicine that was very simple, very accessible, that anybody could do it. They didn't have to have higher education. Um, and his, um, his system was uh, described as quite heroic. And when I say heroic, uh, I mean that he was using very strong, very potent uh, doses of herbs um, to produce a reaction, um, but it was actually quite effective for um, some of the issues of the day um, for treating conditions like typhus, typhoid fever, influenza, yellow fever, diphtheria, measles, whooping cough, malaria, um, a lot of the infectious diseases that were rampant um, during his lifetime. And the herbal remedies that he um, proposed and used were actually less toxic than some of the popular allopathic remedies um, that included bleeding, mercury, arsenic, opium, emetics, and purgatives. Uh, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, don't, uh, can we go back actually? I wanted to um, talk through the different categories. Um, these are four broad categories that um, Samuel Thompson used. Diaphoretics, these are things that open the pores and make you sweat. Um, astringents, uh, tighten up tissues, so they close the pores. Emetics make you vomit. Um, sedatives make you sleepy. Um, and bitters um, stimulate digestion. Um, and there are uh, some representative examples of different herbs for those different categories of action. Okay, next slide. Um, Samuel Thompson, uh, one of his most famous, famous formulas was composition powder. 
and uh, it consists of five different ingredients. Um, and when we talk about uh, his primary theory that heat equals life, we can look at the energetic qualities of this formula and see that it is warm, 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 hot, and warm. So this is a formula that is going to heat you up. And um, um, it consists of bayberry, white pine, ginger, cayenne, and clove. And these would typically all be ground into a powder and combined and um, taken probably by a half a teaspoon at a time. Um, this formula is still used today. And in fact, when I was going through herb school, one of our early assignments was to make this formula. So I've made this, um, I have tested it. It does warm you up, it does make you sweat. Um, one of the things that I'd like to point out about this chart is the kinds of information that we see when we're looking at this here. So in the first column, we have herb names and we have a common name and a Latin name. Um, in going through those herbs, we see that the part, the specific part of the plant is noted. So we have a bark and a second bark and a root and cayenne pepper, that's the fruit of that plant that we're talking about, and clove buds, that's the flower of the plant. So we see the name of the plant, the part of the plant, uh, how much is used in the recipe, what its energetic qualities are, and what its specific actions are. Okay, next slide, please. Um, eclectic medicine is a system of medicine that was popular for much of the 18th century in the United States. Um, and we're going to talk through a few of the well-known figures from that movement in that era. So Alva Curtis was a, a student of or an assistant to Samuel Thompson. And um, he incorporated a lot of what he learned from Thompson. But um, as I mentioned, Thompson was known to be pretty stubborn and Alva Curtis wanted to be a little more um, accepting of uh, higher education and uh, ongoing learning. And he ended up founding his own school called the Physiomedicalists. Um, Wooster Beach was a doctor um, whose professional medical system emphasized indigenous herbal materia medica. So those are the plants that we find native to North America. Uh, he created what was first known as the Reformed Botanic Movement or the American System of Medicine. And it later was named the Eclectic System. John King, another doctor, um, discovered active constituent resins. So this is a process of distilling some of the active constituents within a plant and separating it out from the crude plant material. Um, and one of the resins that he um, extracted in this manner it was podophyllin, which is still used today as a, a drug uh, used to treat uh, HPV, human papillomavirus. So that was discovered or first isolated by John King in the 1800s. Uh, John Milton Scudder authored the Specific Medication and Specific Medicines and another book called Specific Diagnosis. Each herb carefully studied to find its particular indications in clinical practice. Uh, next slide. So we're talking about herbal medicine in the United States. Um, and I wanna just give a little bit of context of what else is going on in the world in this era. Um, so Carl Linnaeus uh, was known for publishing the Systema Natura, which um, was considered the starting point of botanical nomenclature, a system of nature through the three kingdoms of nature, according to classes, orders, genera, and species with characters, differences, synonyms, and places. So when we talk about the Latin names of plants, we're talking about the Linnaean system that was uh, developed in the mid 1700s. Um, and we see it illustrated here. Um, this is an example of the rose and what species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, and kingdom the rose plant belongs to. Um, 
also around this time, we're um, discovering the origin of species with Charles Darwin. And uh, he published On the Origin of Species in 1859. And it was quite controversial at the time. Um, he, uh, his idea of natural selection was in direct contrast to prevailing beliefs of the time that special creation was um, God specially created each species in its present form and it remained constant. And so uh, Darwin's observations really sort of turned that on its head. And when he first published, uh, he, he resisted publishing his findings for several decades because he feared the controversy that would and did result. So that's some of the context of what is going on scientifically with plants and animals in the world around this time. Next slide. Back to the United States and continuing our overview of eclectic physicians. Uh, we've got Harvey Wicks Felter, um, who was the editor of the Eclectic Medical Journal, the co-author of King's Dispensary, so uh, back there with John King, um, he wrote his own dispensary, um, which was a, a voluminous textbook. Um, Felter was also an author of the Eclectic Materia Medica, Pharmacology and Therapeutics. And that was actually published in 1922. So we're getting into the uh, very early 20th century here. Um, John Uri Lloyd was a pharmacist um, and he had a couple of different brothers. Um, and they founded the Lloyd Brothers Pharmacists in 1855. Uh, John Lloyd oversaw research and development concerning pharmaceutical chemistry. His brother Curtis researched botanical and mycological literature, mycology being the field of fungi, mushrooms. Um, and some of the titles that I'm including here um, Finley Ellingwood wrote American Materia Medica, Therapeutics and Pharmacognosy, one of the greatest works on specific medication ever published. Some of these are still used in naturopathic colleges today. So they are by no means obsolete or um, outdated. Um, Eli Jones, uh, another medical doctor, created a synthesis of eclectic, homeopathic, biochemic, and physiomedicalist systems that employs tongue, pulse, and facial diagnosis to determine each person's unique disease patterns. So he's really trying to encompass all of the different modalities uh, that he knew of at the time uh, to use, as, uh, as many of us like to say, all the tools in the toolbox. Um, and some of these uh, uh, diagnostic tools that he's using, tongue diagnosis, pulse diagnosis, those also come from Eastern medicine traditions. And we're not going to go too much into Eastern medicine traditions today, but uh, just know that those have been incorporated into the American system of practice. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we have turned the corner into the 20th century. And uh, the Flexner Report, which was written in 1909 on the medical education in the United States and Canada, um, was actually uh, a turning point in the development of herbal medicine and its acceptance alongside allopathic medicine and um, in the training of medical doctors. Um, as the text says here, it exerted a significant impact on the growth of North American biomedicine and had a large deleterious effect on the later development of complementary and alternative medicine. It led to the shutting down of a majority of uh, CAM, complementary and alternative medicine oriented colleges and programs before and after World War I. Um, so modern scientific medicine had come to be challenged by a variety of competing and contemporary approaches within the medical marketplace, such as naturopathy, traditional homeopathy, chiropractic, osteopathic medicine, and eclectic forms of therapy. Um, Flexner really did not like a lot of these other systems. He pejoratively attacked as charlatanism and quackery. 
and advocated for the closing of nearly 80% of all of the contemporary programs of that era. And uh, this is a trend that we do see popping up from time to time throughout, um, throughout the practice of herbal medicine, um, where it is sometimes uh, disregarded and downplayed, um, and I'm gonna say disrespected. Uh, next slide. So looking into the era of the world wars in the 20th century, um, this is a plant map of the United States, the medicinal plant map of the United States of America, published by the National Wholesale Druggists Association in 1932. And the plant names are in accordance with the US Pharmacopoeia and the National Formulary. So these are both um, standard, texts that uh, outline herbal medicine and herbal medicine treatment. Um, and one of the corners of the map here says, few people realize the extent to which plants and minerals enter into the practice of pharmacy and how vital they are to the maintenance of public health. It has been stated that upwards of 70% of all medicines employed are the products of plants. Intense scientific study, expert knowledge, extreme care and accuracy are applied by the pharmacist to medicinal plants and drugs from the point of origin, where the plant was originally harvested, through the intricate chemical, botanical and pharmaceutical processes employed in preparing medicine. So that's a good reminder for us that um, pharmacists who are working with plant materials and Mm, harvesting them, preparing them, distilling them um, themselves. And that was a big part of pharmacy practice. And that goes back to um, the definition of pharmacognosy that uh, we looked at um, towards the beginning. Okay, next slide, please. Meanwhile, in Europe, uh, a little more context of what is going on um, at in this era. Um, Mrs. Maud Grieve um, was a well-known herbalist in England and um, was a founder of an herb school, a member of the Royal Horticultural Society, president of the British Guild of Herb Growers, um, and she was the author of a famous textbook, the, um, A Modern Herbal, which was published in 1931. And in, uh, in the context of, within the context of World War I um, in Britain, within a few months of the outbreak of war in 1914, the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries issued a leaflet, the cultivation and collection of medicinal plants to encourage the growing of herbs in wartime. And so with supply chain disruptions do, uh, due to war, they were really encouraging everybody at home to grow medicinal plants so that you had your own pharmacy in your front yard. Efforts to marginalize herbalists were undermined by the effects of the wartime campaign. Um, and that quote actually comes from uh, womenshistorynetwork.org. Um, next slide. Back in the United States during wartime, a um, couple of more uh, historical figures to, uh, to look at. Jethro Kloss was well known for the book uh, Back to Eden. Um, I imagine some of you have heard of that book and may, may have a copy of it yourself. Um, and that book outlined, uh, it was published in 1939. It outlined his method of natural self-healing based on herbs and diet and a life in harmony with nature. Um, Dr. Raymond Christopher was, uh, was a proponent of herbal medicine who was on a mission to um, educate herbalists. He wanted there to be an herbalist in every home and a master herbalist in every community. Um, so this comes back to this idea of having the, uh, having the tools for maintaining your own health at your disposal. Uh, and then in 
World War I and World War II in the United States, we saw the popularity of victory gardens. And while victory gardens were focused a little bit more on growing fruits and vegetables for food, not specifically for herbal medicine, there was definitely a connection to the land and the notion of self-sufficiency. And those are both common themes among herbal practitioners uh, throughout history and up, up until today. Uh, next slide. Okay. In the United States, we saw a little bit of a lull in herbal activities in the 1950s and uh, early 1960s. Um, and this corresponded really with a rise in uh, pharmaceutical chemistry and um, um, uh, really um, an emphasis in science over nature rather than science with nature. And then later in the 60s, we saw more of a counterculture revolution and uh, back to the land movement. Um, and um, a few particular historical events that really started to get people interested in herbal medicine and other modalities of healing again. Um, and one of the big ones was when Richard Nixon visited China in 1972 and uh, he and his wife witnessed acupuncture and uh, um, I believe there are stories that also that uh, he became ill while he was there and received acupuncture as part of his treatment. Um, here in California, Dr. Miriam Lee pioneered the use of acupuncture in the United States and partly through her practice, which was at the time illegal, um, and through the advocacy of the very many clients and patients that she treated, acupuncture was uh, legalized in California in 1976. So acupuncture in itself is uh, not exactly a practice of using herbs, but it is one of the branches of traditional Chinese medicine and is closely connected to uh, using herbs for medicine in that system. Uh, and then we're getting into the 1970s and 1980s. Rosemary Gladstar uh, founded the California School of Herbal Studies in 1978. That was the first herbal school in California. Uh, and then we've got a few um, professional member organizations that all popped up in the late 80s, the American Herbal Products Association, the American Botanical Council, and the American Herbalist Guild. Um, one thing I will say here about practitioners, there are uh, different designations. Uh, naturopathic doctors work with herbal medicine. Acupuncturists primarily by definition work with uh, acupuncture needles. Some acupuncturists also work with herbs, some don't. Those are both licensed practices, uh, licensed professions in the state of California. Uh, the practice of herbal medicine is not licensed by the state or the federal government. And um, herbal medicine is, there are pros and cons to that. Herbal medicine is, is sometimes considered the people's medicine and um, with the idea that if you have a little bit of knowledge about how to identify a weed and how to prepare it and you know what its basic actions are, um, you don't have to pay the money to go to uh, um, higher education and, and become a medical doctor and anybody can be an herbalist. Um, so there's some uh, arguments on both sides of licensure for the practice of herbal medicine. All right, next slide. Okay. In reviewing herbal medicine in the 17 and 1800s in the United States, you know, we looked at a lot of white men. And um, as we know, those often historically were the people who had access to get higher education and to write books. And those are the books that are handed down to us today. So I wanted to at least highlight some of the contemporary 21st century herbalists um, Dr. Tiarona Lodog, Dr. Claudia Ford, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, each of these herbalists are doing 
incredible research that I find really exciting, and I encourage you to learn a little bit more about them. Uh, next slide. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about regulation in uh, contemporary United States. So DSHEA is the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act that was signed into law in 1994 by President Bill Clinton um, with two primary goals, to ensure the continued consumer access to a wide variety of dietary supplements and provide consumers with more information about the intended use of dietary supplements. Um, there is a history that led up to this act where uh, there had been sort of an ongoing contentious relationship between um, vitamin manufacturers and uh, the legal and regulatory agencies. And the FDA was leaning strongly towards regulating herbs and vitamins as drugs. And there was a lot of resistance to that popularly, um, a lot of grassroots resistance um, because people were concerned that if vitamins and herbs were regulated as drugs, then you would need a prescription to get them and it would remove access. So the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act um, was written to find a way to provide some regulation for dietary supplements uh, while still making them available over the counter so that they, uh, they were still accessible. Next slide. Uh, so what did the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act define? Um, it defined food as separate from a drug and as separate from a dietary supplement. Um, food being the things that we eat, um, drugs uh, intended for diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, and dietary supplement, a product intended to supplement the diet, uh, vitamin, mineral, herb, or botanical amino acid. Um, herbal medicine is considered a subcategory of dietary supplements. So herb or botanical is in there along with vitamin, mineral, amino acid, um, and there are a few other things. And that's actually an important distinction for me as an herbalist, because um, I primarily work with plants and I don't necessarily um, work with any uh, work with uh, a lot of the other kinds of dietary supplements that are available. Um, and I, I get a little bit annoyed sometimes when I see research or clinical studies or articles in um, places like the Journal of the American Medical Association that conflates all dietary supplements with herbs. Um, I have seen shark cartilage called an herb. And I think, my goodness, did your medical degree not teach you the difference between an animal part and a plant part? They're two different kingdoms. So that's one of my little pet peeves about um, all of dietary supplements being lumped together. Um, all herbal products are considered dietary supplements. Not all dietary supplements are herbs. So part of this legislation led to the definition of current good manufacturing practices, or um, that is abbreviated to CGMPs. Um, and a lot of this boils down to documentation. So if you are an herbal medicine manufacturer, or if you are an herbal medicine practitioner and you are um, giving herbs to your clients, you have to document uh, where the herb is coming from and where it is going. Um, so this is legally required by the uh, Code, of Code of Federal Regulations, Part 111, and uh, this gets broken down into looking at herbal medicine or dietary supplements and defining the identity, the purity, the strength, and the composition. And we're going to look at that a little bit. All right, next slide, please. So botanical identification, 
Um, there are a series of tiers, different tiers of testing. So gross organoleptic testing um, means what you can tell with your five senses. What does it look like? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? Um, and uh, I have also heard professional herbalists talk about what an herb sounds like. Um, and specifically, uh, one example of that is if they're talking about fresh or dried herb, they want to know how crunchy and crispy it sounds um, versus how soggy or squishy it sounds. And that will tell you a little bit about moisture content. Um, and taste, um, I want to mention real quickly while we're on the subject of organoleptic analysis. Um, in traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, both of those systems have categories of taste. Traditional Chinese medicine, five element theory categorizes sweet, sour, salty, spicy, and bitter. Um, this is also anatomically and physiologically recognized. So it is not just a part of traditional Chinese medicine, but it's also part of Western physiology. These are five taste categories. Um, and when we can learn to identify these different tastes, it will tell us something a little about the properties and the mechanism of action of that herb. Um, the taste is pretty directly associated to what kinds of chemical constituents are in the plant. All right, next slide. So botanical identification macroscopic analysis looks at um, botany. So studying the plant parts, the shape of the leaf, the color, the texture, um, this helps you um, botanically key out the identity of the plant. Um, and when we're talking about herbal medicine manufacturing, um, we want to identify the plants at all the different stages through uh, the manufacturing process. So in this central column of pictures that we're looking at here, I believe this is a golden seal root. Uh, and the top picture shows us the root that is still pretty whole, pretty entire. The middle picture shows us the root that's been chopped up. And the bottom picture shows us the root that has been ground into a powder. Now, in the top picture, uh, we have some hope of identifying this through macroscopic analysis. But in the bottom picture, once it's been ground into a powder, you can't do that anymore. So it, when it's in the powder form, then you need to move on to the next tier of identification testing. Um, and this is showing low tech to high tech. So if we have the whole plant, we can use a botanical key that's a lower technology. Um, uh, but when we're looking at the powder, then we're gonna need more tools, uh, higher technology to identify what that powder is. All right, next. Um, microscopic analysis. Um, so you're going to need a microscope to do this part. Um, what you can, uh, what you cannot see with the naked eye. Um, and once you get into microscopic analysis, this will help to identify a plant. Um, and then the next stage is chromatography, um, separating a mixture by passing it into a solution, suspension, or a vapor through a medium in which the components move at different rates. So if we can just go back to the previous slide for a moment, please. When we're looking at this picture in the corner um, next to where it says higher tech and we see the gradations of sort of blue and violet and white, um, that is an image of a chromatography results. And each of those color bands represents a different chemical constituent that's been extracted from a plant. And that can be used to identify uh, the chemical components that have been extracted from a plant. Um, and this is used uh, regularly, um, pretty regularly by um, some of the major herbal medicine manufacturers in the United States, like Herb Farm or Gaia Herbs. Um, 
they're growing their own herbs on their farm, they're harvesting it themselves, they've got their own an, uh, laboratory where they can do this kind of um, HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography, to make sure that the herbs that they've grown in the field have the active constituent that is um, uh, medicinally therapeutic. Okay, next. And uh, next again, please. So coming back to our regulations, um, the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act not only um, specifies how you have to identify the plant, but also how you label the product that you are making for sale. And this picture is an example of a tincture from the company Herb Farm. They're based in Oregon. And uh, some of the information that we're looking at on this label says what the common name is, the genus and species. So that's bringing us back to Carl Linnaeus and binomial nomenclature. Uh, it tells us the specific plant part, whether we are, um, in this case with California poppy, we can use the whole plant. So it is the fresh root, leaf and flower all together. Um, it tells us where it was grown, if it is certified organic or if it's wild crafted, it was just picked out in the wild. Um, and we see that this label is compliant with both food and drug administration regulations and also the Federal Trade Commission regulations. So these are all points that are specified uh, as part of DSHEA. Um, something that I wanna point out here, um, this label is for a product that is an alcoholic extract. And that means that the herb was ground down, soaked in alcohol, and then pressed so that you get the alcoholic extract and you throw away the, the mark, the dried herb. Um, and all of the active chemical constituents have been pressed and extracted into the alcohol. Um, alcohol is used because it is an excellent solvent. So it works to just draw those chemical constituents out of the plant matter. And it might be a little bit hard to see if you turn your head sideways, um, you can see on the side where it says the alcohol percentage. For this tincture, it is 54 to 64%. And uh, that might seem kind of high, but when you look at it um, for the size of this product, we're looking at a one fluid ounce bottle. So it's, mm, if you think about this in terms of, um, spirits that you would drink if you were going to drink a shot of tequila um, that would be about one and a half ounces so this is a smaller bottle than that and this label tells us what the suggested use is the serving size or the dose and the dose is 30 to 40 drops so it's uh, really not very much at all um, 30 drops is about one milliliter and the whole ounce contains about 30 milliliters so I sometimes see people looking at um, the amount of alcohol and thinking, oh my goodness, that's so strong. Um, it's all relative. The amount of alcohol that you're actually getting is pretty minuscule and it's in there because it serves as a delivery vehicle to deliver the active chemical constituents from the plant into your bloodstream where they can become uh, bioactive. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Oh, there's pictures. Uh, so we've got a couple of images of a stereotypical druggist or phytochemist from Norman Rockwell's versions of the 1950s. Um, and there's a picture of me in a position that I held as a dispensary supervisor at a clinic um, a few years ago. And you can see all those tincture bottles on the shelf um, behind me. And I have to point out that this picture was taken at an open house. So I was not wearing my apron or lab coat um, or my personal protective equipment, um, but uh, we were making tea and I've got some um, gallon jars full of tea for the open house at that particular event. Uh, next. All right. Um, herbal medicine is a major component of global healthcare. 
According to the World Health Organization, 80% of the world population uses herbal medicine. This is not an alternative modality. It is the majority. Integrative medicine, in my personal opinion, is our best option as a tool for supporting global health care. And that means using all of the modalities that we have at our resources. So the best of modern science and technology and the best of all of the accumulated wisdom of thousands of years of knowledge. And next. I personally am fascinated by all of the ways that modern science and technology confirm and corroborate ancient wisdom. And I encourage you to uh, keep an open and curious mind when thinking about herbal medicine. I personally have been really pleased in the classes that I've been taking at City College to um, see scientific literacy promoted in uh, most of the classes that I've taken. Um, um, so learning how to interpret what you see in the media, learning how to look for uh, clinical research studies um, and learning how to um, remember to be curious and question what you read and what you watch. Um, and with that, I am going to bring this to a close. Um, and I've got a beautiful picture of a rose there to invite you to remember to smell the roses and enjoy plants, not only for their medicinal properties, but for their beauty as well. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, so we'll open it up to Q&A in just a second. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'll pause the recording. And um, thanks so much, we'll have some great Q&A about this. So let me just uh, stop the recording here.